Hey, how's it going, Wildcats? This is Word to the Wild, Wildcat, and we are back for our first episode of Season 3. This podcast is being brought to you by the Center for Leadership and Community Engagement. For a quick introduction, my name is Tommy Fernandez. My personal pronouns are he, him, his, or my name, and I'm a senior at Central, majoring in ITAM, and with me today is Aureli. What's up, Wildcats? My name is Areli Ruiz. My pronouns are she, her, ellas. I'm a senior here at Central Washington University studying elementary education. So we are very excited to be back and hosting this podcast. We have so many great guests lined up for this winter quarter. The theme of this particular podcast is health and wellness. And joining us today is the amazing Dr. Shante Elbert. She is the Associate Dean for the Health and Wellness for Central Washington University. Shante, thank you so much for joining us here today. I'm so glad to be here and I'm excited to share and learn from you all throughout the next hour or so. That's great. Can you tell the Wildcats exactly like what your position is or what you do really quick? Absolutely. So I'm Dr. Shante Elbert. I use she, her, her pronouns. I am the Associate Dean for Health and Wellness. I'm located under the Dean of Student Success portfolio um, and my office pre-COVID is in Bouillon. Um, and so I have the Recreation Center, Wellness Center, Student Health, Student Counseling, and Disability Services under my portfolio. And so my job is to be um, the uh, part of the team of health and wellness services and departments um, and how we approach providing comprehensive and integrated approach to care for you all uh, while you're students here at Central. Um, and then I liaison with faculty and staff on how they can help support students' um, health and well-being. And I also serve in some community roles where I sit on committees um, around health and wellness since many of our students utilize um, local um, health networks and things like that. That's great. Yeah, that's great. And um, Shante, as you mentioned, I'm sure that this fall quarter was very difficult in the process of planning in response to our current uh, COVID-19 pandemic. What were some of the challenges that you had to face during this quarter? And also what were some of the accomplishments? I would definitely say because my position is brand new, everything um, was new for me and created some forms of challenges because um, for instance, um, last year, you know, measles was going around in the community, not too far from us. Um, and most campuses already have an immunization policy and we didn't have, we don't have one here. We just passed it earlier this year. And so not knowing who is immunocompromised, who is immunized, um, last year was already stressful um, as I was hoping it would not get closer to us. As it got closer and closer to um, Kittitas County, I was having some very uh, large heart palpitations. And so when COVID came around, it only exacerbated those same feelings because COVID is also similar to measles as is, it's easily spreadable and it's spread through, um, uh, obviously through talking and air um, particulates in the air. And so when COVID hit, it was, I still don't know who's immunocompromised. And eventually we know a vaccine will come and I still don't know who's vaccinated or not. And so we're working through those processes and what we call that more population health. Um, what does the population's health look like? And so COVID only made me get a little bit more anxious that I don't, I don't have a really good pulse on where our students' health and wellness is, at least from a very um, administrative level. And then COVID also gave me a, a sense of angst because we were sending students home. And that is either a great thing for some students or a very challenging or potentially toxic situation for some students. And whether they have the ability to communicate that can be challenging for some students to say, I, I can't go home. I, I, I don't have consistent food, a place to sleep, um, water, lights, um, or safety. I mean, is there domestic violence? And so COVID only exacerbated the things that we already worry about when it comes to our students, when it comes to basic needs and safety and well being. But COVID put it in a situation where we didn't have a chance to really get a pulse before we sent students home. Um, and then a lot of students didn't have hotspots, internet. So the disparities showed up um, very quickly. And that was, as a, as a black woman, 
having internet is a privilege. And so it made me even more mindful of making sure we're equitable in how we engage our students that we sent home. And then some of the accomplishments is just being able to rally our incident management team together. We've been meeting um, since February, late January, February, and haven't stopped meeting and having this strong group of people all meeting on a sometimes daily, definitely weekly basis to say, we want to centralize the health and safety of our employees and students. How do we do that? Knowing that literally sometimes it felt like things were changing on a weekly basis. And I, I feel so privileged to be part of that team of professionals who without question centered the health and well-being of our campus community, uh, even if that meant working on weekends, um, working pre eight o'clock, after five o'clock, weekends, um, that type of dedication, many people didn't know we were doing all of that, but that's what we did. And I am, um, that's a sense of accomplishment because I have colleagues who have horror stories of what those first couple of months and what the lingering months have been, um, trying to rally a team of professionals together to have one central thought on how you support the campus. And so that's where we are. So I'm, I'm happy where we are. We have some system, systems in place. Um, we're almost to that point where I can say we're a fine oil machine, not quite there, but we're close. Um, and so I'm, I'm happy to be at that place, um, especially with the size campus that we have and the limited resources that we have compared to some of our kind of parts across the state who have a medical school or a larger hospital system nearby. That just puts a lot of things into perspective for me. I know we've already discussed some of the things that have been challenging the health and wellness uh, portion of our school, but those are just some interesting things. Like I, for one, didn't realize, like I had some idea that there was going to be some issues with disparities and having certain students um, either fall behind or not even being able to attend the way that they normally would. Me being here for five years already, I would have never thought in a million years that I would have been a part of this campus while they were struggling with this situation. Mm -hmm. And I, for one, am very thankful for all of you and your team and want to extend a thanks just because I know, I didn't know how much hard work was going into all that was being produced in terms of keeping us safe. And I, for one, am guilty of being, I'm so frustrated with what's going on, but you know what? I just want to say thank you. And thank you for sharing that with um, the Wildcats because that's really important to hear. No problem. And the last thing I'll add that I'm, I want to give a shout out to my student health staff. There's many other um, campus entities like housing and dining and police who kept uh, staying on campus and being front facing. But my student health staff who stayed and kept the building open while there are some campuses who closed their student health, they still came in day in, day out. And while there was some, you know, fear and trepidation as we started to learn more about how the the virus is spread, they still put themselves on the front line along with the housing and dining and police and other facilities and housekeepers who came in day in, day out. Uh, those are the unsung heroes of, of our campus community. And there's a not enough thank yous that I can say before um, I lose my voice to, to tell them thank you for putting their sales. And then the rest of the campus who flipped over everything to make sure students still had engagement activities, especially those of us in student success who found ways to still engage with you all. Recreation, who moved heavy machines. I mean, I saw them move treadmills uh, across the entire building with just uh, two or three people um, of staff and, and then students came and helped. I mean, they did it in a week's time. I mean, yeah, I am overwhelmed with thankfulness. And if I hit the lottery, I would do a, a pizza party to take us back to nostalgia of elementary school of winning the pizza party for your class. But that's how grateful I am for the work that we've done as a campus. When you look at our numbers, when you look at um, how many cases we've had, we have a lot to be proud of. Yeah, yeah, I agree with you 100%. Even for our own um, department, Center for Leadership and Community Engagement, we had to do a lot just to see how can we provide our services virtually to students and I'm sure I can imagine like one of the challenges for maybe you in the Health and Wellness Center was how could we address all of our students that are not here in Ellensburg? Because there's this year so many students decided to stay home 
And I can imagine that that was just a whole new level of just stresses, just getting used to the new online format and just not being on campus. Absolutely. I mean, I did my second year of my master's program fully online and my doctorate fully online. So I embraced online learning, but you have to be a different type, being a different type of mindset to yeah. do a fully online semester or quarter. Um, and it's a different type of work ethic where you're, you're the one leading a lot of the conversations with your faculty, especially depending on how engaged your faculty can be. And so, you know, just in undergrad, when I was sitting in the front row and asked questions, I was the same way online. They'd be like, who is this person emailing me? Me? Um, and I don't think, I think some students approach the online um, courses the way they approach face-to-face -face, where they can kind of sit in the middle in the back of the classroom, still glean information, go study, go to office hours and be fine. Online learning is not the same. And yeah. so I, I don't think of some of our students were prepared for it. And then that's why some students decided to not even enroll or come back because I mean, it's a different type of environment period. And who wants to, you know, virtually high five everybody every day or, you know, across you know, six feet, hey, you know, waving at everybody. I, I think people just didn't know what to expect. And so, um, but for those who moved on campus, um, we've heard good feedback, that, you know, what the experiences they were able to have. Um, so we're still learning. So given kind of like what Tommy asked in terms of like contributing y'all services to our students, how have y'all been able to maintain the momentum of trying to get students to kind of engage either? Because I know for me, it's taken a toll on either my mental health, my time management, my sleep schedule has most definitely suffered because of the whole COVID era. So um, how have y'all been able to like, what kind of services? Because um, I for one have not been as connected to the wellness, health and wellness aspect of it all for Central, how have y'all been able to maintain that momentum to make sure that students have the services that they need? So I, I know within student success, they've had, um, I think a partnership in student activities of like a game night with recreation, two of those staff members partner up and do a Kahoot game night. Mm -hmm. um, I, I kept telling myself I was gonna make one and it just never happened. Um, recreation still had virtual, um, group fitness classes um, over the over the quarter, um, wellness center, the DEC, um, and counseling had their versions of either yoga or mindfulness meditation. And so those were all still going on through virtual um, um, formats. And so those things still happen, but I, you know, students have to go look for it. And um, that's the biggest thing about engagement. Students have to want it and go look for it. And, and find ways to engage. And it's no different from when you're on campus, but it definitely is a little bit more challenging when you're at home because you just can't look up at the TV and see what's scrolling um, on the TVs in the, in, in the search and say, oh, this is happening tonight. Hey y'all, let's go. You actually have to log on to Twitter or Instagram to see what is popping, if y'all still say that. Um, <laughs> and so um, I think that's the, the difference is when it comes to um, mental health specifically, counseling has fully shifted and done virtual options for students, whether it's through telephonic counseling or through their Zoom platform. They've transitioned over uh, therapists where, you know, most therapists love face-to-face. -face. And so even for them, they were like, are we sure we can't see them? We can't see them, y'all. Your offices are not big enough for six feet. Um, and so even the, the, the staff had to find ways to to embrace this new platform because it's not the natural thing for most therapists to want to do a virtual appointment. And so um, they still have been seeing students. They still have done individual group. Um, they've had the drop-in sessions. Um, they've done um, some of the uh, partnerships with the DEC um, uh, uh, in some of the newer group sessions that they've had specifically around um, people of color and some of the other groups the DEC have. Um, support groups. We had a COVID support group um, this quarter also. So counseling is doing some really great work. They have an Instagram page that just hit 600 followers, according to Cindy, the director yesterday. And I was like, she and her team have been grinding to get more students engaged. And they've done some live, you know, Instagram lives. And so they're trying different ways. But one of the things I shared this morning at our incident management team was that mental health 
um, is serious. But I want to emphasize it's not the it's not a period. Um, I want the campus to keep looking at the whole student. And so we have those nine dimensions of wellness that we use here on campus. I'm gonna try to name them out without pulling up my graphic. Um, physical, mental, emotional, um, social, financial, environmental, cultural, vocational, occupational, which is your job, um, intellectual, environmental. Um, and so we have those nine dimensions of wellness. And so I'm, I'm reminding people mental health is one dimension, but what we see is not always the root cause of it. So if I'm having stressors and I'm having an anxiety attack, that may not be because I have anxiety, diagnosable anxiety. It may be because whatever, I just took finals, grades just got posted, or I just got laid off from my job, and now my body is reacting to that stressor. Yeah. And so I reminded my team this morning to not put all of our eggs in the mental health basket because what we see, the behavior, the outcome, what we show is one, what we allow to be seen. Um, and two, it, it may not be the root cause of what we're seeing projected out. So my crying may not be sad tears, it could be happy. Um, and the reason why I may be feeling uh, having a depressive episode, but not depressed is because of filling the blank. And so reminding us to look at the whole person because yeah. as a black female, I am upset with COVID keeping me in a very uh, insular environment, but I'm also just as upset about the systemic injustices that are still happening, i.e. Columbus two days ago. So I think I don't want people to compartmentalize your identities. They are all who I am and mental health is either a diagnosable issue, it could be episodic, or the behavior that what we are allowing things to come out, what people see. So I see that you're upset, but then why are you upset? Let's get to the, the root cause of it. And so for me, mental health is just one aspect of this, financial wellness, you know, social justice, those things are still very, very important to me. Um, um, and so those are some of the things that I'm reminding people to be mindful of mental health. And it's also much more palpable um, to say mental and emotional health because there's still some stigma behind it in certain cultures and populations. And so the things I really want to push is look at the whole person, yeah. see all of me. Because right now I'm thriving occupationally, but culturally, a lot of people of color are just suffering in the midst of COVID because we are disproportionately being impacted by COVID and dying from COVID. All those can coexist at the same time. But I just wanna say uh, thank you for sharing that perspective because what you said just made like so much sense to me. And, you know, I think one thing that is gonna be very important, especially for like this next upcoming quarter is how students, you know, practice their wellness. How do they practice their self care because you know, as it's already outside getting darker and everything, there's going to be a lot of, it's going to be different from last quarter, but it's how do students like respond and how do they make sure that they are taking care of themselves so that some of the stresses that they may face in life, they have ways that they can, you know, counteract that and care for themselves. I call it the two bill for those who like to build things and that is not me. And then for those of us who like to cook, I, that's why I use the kitchen analogy. Um, and, you know, I always talk about my granny not having a, a crock pot. She don't believe in crock pots and still to this day doesn't have one. Um, but when she cooks a good meal, she uses multiple types of pots and pans, the oven and the stove. She preps some stuff the day before, cooks throughout the day. That is what wellness is about. Some take some prep work, some take some trying throughout the day, but also it's different types of meals. You got your appetizers, your main course, your sides and your dessert. All of them can be done on the stove, in the stove, outside of the stove, but it's trying something, it's a nice buffet. And then for those who like to build, you, you got to have the nails, the hammer, the screwdriver and everything else in between to build something. And when you're missing a tool, you don't realize it till you need it. And that's how I look at wellness. You have to try different things. And I always talk about me reading romance novels 
the cheesy ones, like the 99 cent books that nobody yeah. talks about. My yeah. twin used to read them all the time and I never read them. But this past year I started reading them and it has been so helpful to just take my mind away and read a cheesy love story about whatever. Um, and it's been helpful for me just to find a way to just recenter, read something or go in there and cook or cut on some reggae and hip hop. I love reggae tone. And, and so poor neighbors, they just don't even know. Um, and so <laughs> what I'm doing multiple things to recenter, not just one. And I yeah. think um, my, my homework for you all and for those who listen to this is try something new. Whatever you do for your wellness, if you put it in your phone, which some of my stuff is in here, or you use a calendar, write it in Sharpie, it's, non it's non-negotiable. And you have to do something. Try something new every month. So that's your homework. And then for those who listen, it's your homework. I'll check in with you later. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so something that we also talked about not too long ago was just how you engage with your work because everything that you're mentioning is just great advice. I love that you even assigned us homework because I'm already practicing on some of the stuff that you're mentioning. So I don't like homework, but I'll take on your homework. <laughs> mm -hmm. But um, just in terms of how you engage with us as students versus like how you engage with us or engage with administration, I know that that was a really important um, topic that we discussed not too uh, long ago about how we can advocate for ourselves in terms of how we want to show up in at Central, how we're going to show up and how we can talk to administration in terms of our needs and what we want. So the first thing is I tell students, if you pay for the service, you use it. Um, I, I just had a parent post in the parent group, hey, can my student use student health? Are they still open? Yes, they're still open. If they pay the fee, Go right on over, make an appointment. Um, I think a lot of times um, people don't know that student health is a real medical clinic, you know, it's rays lab, they can do casting, just like any standard primary care. We have a dietitian. I mean, most students, if you don't embrace the services, you won't know everything they have to offer. So if you're paying for it, and you won't get these type of prices post-graduation, try it out. This is the safest way to try new services and be able to ask questions with staff who know that the, the whole purpose is for you to learn to embrace it. So that way, when you go out and graduate and you're paying for it out of your pocket in a very different way, that you can get the best bang for your book. And when you meet a doctor that you don't appreciate, you know how to advocate and say what you say. So I always tell students, one, utilize the services that you pay for. Try to work out, go to the wellness center, stop by disability services to learn something. You may learn something not for you, but for your peers. Second of all, fill out the surveys. If you are going to something, whether you liked it or not, fill out the surveys. Sometimes that's the only way we get feedback from you all um, on how we are doing, whether there's the satisfaction surveys that many of the departments do with student success. Uh, I know Donnie has surveys, but the faculty asks students to fill out surveys about how the faculty did for that quarter. Fill out the surveys. I'm waiting for my surveys because I teach online too. I'm waiting for the surveys to come back so I can learn what I did well, what I didn't, and where I can grow. Now, hopefully everybody has that mindset to grow from even the negative feedback. Now, once you do all those things, if you see there's some gaps in what you all want and need, and you don't know how to approach it, that's where ASCWU comes in, or go directly to the staff, the directors, or some of the administrators and say, hey, can I just sit down and ask questions? We're here for you. Um, ask questions, ask about the budget, ask how our service models were created, ask how we serve the diversity of our student population. You know, I remember when I first got here, many of the students asked me how I was gonna diversify my departments because none of my departments had staff of color. I said, well, what I can do is give you consistent feedback and show you receipts on how we have started to transcend how we do searches. I can show you where we've started to post our positions where we normally wouldn't have posted them, such as Black ladies in public health, Latinos in higher ed group, like all these different culturally based groups that we normally didn't post to. I can show you we did these extra things. 
Um, but if the hire didn't happen, it's not because we didn't do our work. I think that's the part where I believe in showing receipts, especially since students pay a fee for many of my areas where student fee funded. You should be able to come in and ask those questions and I should be able to show you how we're truly serving the diversity of our student population. And asking, you know, asking administration, hey, you know, we see some gaps here or we have some questions. You know, I always believe in coming prepared. So any meeting I have, there's always an agenda, just like you all sent me questions. Same thing, same approach. You are learning transferable skills from school to, profession, to your professional world. Never show up for a meeting unprepared. I always have an agenda, whether it's you share it out with them in advance or not, you come in prepared and, and have some talking points and then have some suggestions on what you think could be beneficial. The thing, the thing I learned when I was in your seat was I didn't understand a lot of the back end administrative piece about budgets, hiring practices that can limit how things can happen. Like you just can't hire 50 people of color like that. It's, it really isn't that easy if you don't have the, the funding for it, space for it, all those things impact it. But you all should build that critical thinking skill set and ask those questions. It holds us accountable, but it also gives you that lesson of how to be uh, critical thinkers. So I think that's the biggest way you all as students is, you know, can do that. And if you don't know where there's gaps, look across the country, look at other institutions who are doing things that you wish we could have here. And it may be infrastructure that prevents us from providing it, but we should be able to tell you why the infrastructure prevents us from providing it for you. So ask questions, hold us accountable for being um, student-centered in the work that we do. And to our Wildcats, thank you so much for joining us today. If you enjoyed uh, today's episode, there will actually be a part two featuring Dr. Shante Albert. So stay tuned and that will get out to you. See y'all soon. Thank you.